Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Richardson family. Um, it took three years and a few days to get this case into court, and we met them under the worst possible circumstances. Uh, they have come to our office, different offices. Um, they were never on time, they were always early. And they asked good questions, and they were thoughtful, and they were prepared. They came to Charleston for a day's worth of hearings. They've come to Aiken on several occasions for hearings and sat in court for every minute of jury selection last week. We ran until um, 11.30, I think, on Tuesday night. And on behalf of my office and everybody involved in this case, um, maybe Lynn, I'd like to thank you, Ms. Pat, Ken, um, for y'all's graciousness, for y'all's courtesies, for working with our office, and for being just such a, uh, a great group to work with under truly unimaginable circumstances. We knew that every time we met with y'all and talked about this, we were kind of ripping the band-aid off the scab and we could all see the hurt in y'all's eyes upon the conclusions of those meetings, but you continue to come back, you continue to be involved, and you continue to want to be informed, and that's really all we could ever ask of victims in the cases that our office stands. Any questions? Mr. Thurman, can you explain how the plea agreement came to be, who prompted it, and when did it come about? We met Thursday night after the jury was selected, and my office deliberated late into the evening, and the result of those deliberations was that we were not at all firmly convinced that the jury we had in the panel would arrive at a unanimous death verdict. Um, we met Friday morning, I had made that decision. We met with the Richardson family, we met with the leadership of the Department of Public Safety, and we met with the defense team, and we received Senate sheets pursuant to the terms of the plea that was put together on Friday that you just witnessed here a few moments ago. Are you satisfied with this? Are you satisfied with the plea deal? Um, I, we're, I'm satisfied in as much as we have protected this conviction. Uh, we had concerns both about guilt phase and sentencing phase deliberations. And because we had those concerns and, and lawyers evaluate their cases, not just at the beginning, but at the middle and at the end, and we've even had, had pleas that were taken while the jury was deliberating. We had a case last week where a defendant pled guilty at the conclusion of the state's case. So if, if we got to a point where my overriding interest was in protecting this case, we charted a course that assured it. This case was the uh, most important case in our office, important to me, important to everybody who touched it, and it only takes one juror to hang up in either the guilt phase or the sentencing phase, and that became a concern. Uh, those of y'all who were in here, you watched the, during, uh, during the questioning of jurors, you watched the defense lawyers over and over again instruct the, the prospective jurors on the element of malice had some changes in the law of malice over the last couple of years. Malice used to be inferred from the use of a deadly weapon. That is no longer the case. And by their routine questioning of those jurors on that question, we knew that they were going to um, aggressively assert that the element of malice was not present in this case on either the murder or the attempted murder charge. And we could have had a situation where jurors were hanging up with multiple um, sentencing options, for murder, voluntary manslaughter, attempted murder, assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature. And again, it, it, it only takes one. So we, um, we acted, and uh, we acted decisive, decisively to create a situation where Stephon Carter would never see the outside of a prison to include his waiver of all of his state and federal appellate rights associated with the case, which is which is something fairly unusual. I don't know if many of y'all have seen a, uh, an appeals waiver, part and parcel to appeal. Were you surprised he accepted 
he pleaded guilty. Were you afraid today that it would go down another road? Um, really nothing in this business process any of us anymore. Um, it, you know, I really, it, it did not surprise me that, that he would ultimately accept the plea and the charges, the, the maximum sentences of both charges. Mr. Berman, just to be clear, were you more concerned about the defense arguing that there was a lack of malice in this case, or were you more concerned about the makeup of the jury and their characteristics in deciding? Well, I can't, my, all the lawyers up here, our rules of professional responsibility are going to prevent us from making any specific comment about a juror or jury. So uh, I can't make any comment about the jury we got. I'm very very grateful for their willingness to serve. And if you think about it, to, to essentially move away from home for two weeks um, for the handsome sum of $20 a day, that's a very substantial sacrifice to ask of a citizen. Uh, I will say this about the jury we didn't get. We had 500 questionnaires sent out, 400 initially, and we had so many exemptions claimed that we had to request another 500. 96% um, of our senior citizens, people over the age of 65, um, elected, and it's their right to do so, elected to claim that exemption and not participate. We had folks, uh, quite a few folks asked to be transferred to different terms, folks claiming financial hardships, family hardships, medical hardships, and I certainly understand all that. Um, however, in a case of this magnitude, it would have been good for the process to have a little broader based representation in our jury pool. I think out of the 500 that summonses that we started with, um, after the general qualification was done, we were down to, you know, mere 140. I have to ask this respectfully because, you know, with Facebook and all that, there's already some, you know, there's a lot of reaction. And as you know, um, there's some, gonna, some that have already said, you know, if not the death penalty in this case, what case? And so just to the residents that, you know, you talk to the family and everybody else, but to the residents who really wanted to demand that we seek the death penalty in this case, is there anything that you would say to just? Well, you know, there are a lot of people on Facebook who suddenly have law degrees. And um, I, I think uh, to those who are actually interested or able to come to court and watch the juror selection process, you know, understanding that the defense gets 10 strikes, you know, we only get five. Understanding that there is no right for the state to question a juror. The defense has that right. Uh, we, we moved uh, really out of fairness in, in asking uh, the judge to allow the state not just to ask questions but to alternate. The defense was always wanting to go first. And um, you know, some people forget that while the defendant has a right to a fair trial, the state has a right to a fair trial too. So I was glad that, that Judge Newman saw it that way. Um, you know, every, everyone is entitled to whatever opinion they may want to have, I would just maybe um, encourage folks to, to take a look in the mirror and ask themselves if they would be willing to make the sacrifice that these 12 citizens did to sit in this jury box um, for a, a case like this.